Well, good morning, brothers. We're very, very, very grateful for your presence and for the opening of this conference. We thank God for the privilege of being able to assemble together, to study his word together, to be sharpened through the word of God, sanctified through the truth of his word. I want to open up this morning by reading this very, very familiar passage out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's very familiar, but when I hear it, um, it seems very fresh and new to me every time I hear it, challenging my heart as a man of God. Verse 1, just verse 1 through 5, as Paul pins these words, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming. We know it's here, don't we? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of handling your word, of preaching your word. We thank you for the holy calling that you have on our lives. We thank you for placing us in the body of Christ and using us to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We have gathered this week because we want to deepen our understanding of what it means to preach Christ, to preach the word. Oh, Father, I pray that you would use Pastor Watkins to teach us with such clarity and understanding as the Holy Spirit gives. I pray that you would unite our hearts together in truth. Give us grace to believe together, to submit together. Challenge our hearts, encourage our hearts as well. Heavenly Father, sharpen us as we spend this time with one another. May our fellowship be, be sweet and joyous. May our time together be edifying. May we leave this place with a renewed mind, encouraged to persevere, to continue preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we ask. Amen. Again, welcome, brothers, and we're very thankful that you're here. I want to introduce uh, our morning lecturer. Uh, it's Pastor Davin Watkins. He became the pastor of FBC Pelham in March 2015. Before coming, he served for nearly seven years as the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church, Pleasant Grove, in Pleasant Grove, 
Alabama, and before then he served as senior pastor for eight years at First Baptist Church in Owington, Kentucky. He received his undergraduate degree in history from Georgetown College in 1996. In December 1999, he received his Master of Divinity degree from Beeson Divinity School in Birmingham, Alabama. And in May 2008, he received a Doctor of Ministry degree in preaching from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary outside Boston, Massachusetts. David, excuse me, Davin and his wife, his beautiful wife, let me rephrase that. Davin and his beautiful wife, uh, Jane Ellen, were married on July 6, 1996, and they are the proud parents of two children, uh, Molly, Grace, and Nathan. David enjoys spending time with his family, exercising, and watching We Forgive Him Kentucky basketball. I started not to read that, but it was in the bio. <laughs> My brothers, we, we, we're very thankful. I met this man of God besides meeting him on the phone, but met him personally on last year. He was here with us, and God so blessed us, didn't he? Out of the Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it's still here <laughs> uh, in my mind. God so blessed us through the preaching of the word. As our brother opened his mouth, the spirit of God spoke to us very powerfully through him, setting before us a, a, a spread of truth. So will you join me in, in welcoming uh, uh, Dr. Davin Watkins as he comes to us to bring us the word of God. I will have to leave in about 15 minutes. I have to go pick up Pastor H.B., uh, Charles, his flight gets in at 10.50, okay? <laughs> so, welcome him. I bring you grace and greetings from the saints that gather at First Baptist Church, Pelham. I am so delighted to stand here with you this week, uh, to be with you today and Wednesday in a lecture fashion, and then to really have some fun Tuesday night in a preaching fashion. Amen. So um, we are all indebted to those who have gone before us, right? We are shaped uh, by people who have poured into us, and I stand before you being galvanized and shaped by two primary preachers. Um, the first is Robert Smith, Jr. He is my father in the ministry. I studied with him at Beeson Divinity School. The second is Haddon Robinson. I studied with him at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Both those men have so impressed upon me, uh, not just as a preacher, uh, but as a person. And just uh, as I hope to be uh, the man of God that God has called and crafted me to be. And so I remember when I was studying with Dr. Smith and I was getting ready uh, to pursue a doctorate. And I said, Dad, where, where do you think I need to go? And I had heard Haddon Robinson before. Uh, he had been a guest lecturer at Beeson Divinity School. And Dr. Smith said to me, uh, you need to go wherever Haddon Robinson is whether he's in Denver, Colorado, whether he's in Dallas, Texas, or whether he's in Boston, Massachusetts. And then he said, and I'll never forget, you studied preaching with me. You need to study preaching with him. Then you'll have preaching in black and white. <laughs> so, so it's those two streams that have converged and they wash over me every time I get up to preach. And so, um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for being here, carving out some time uh, to think about this great task of preaching. This morning, we are going to do our best to tackle the topic of preaching Christ. Uh, that is about the three-page packet that you picked up. And then on Wednesday, we're going to talk about communication that connects. That's the more elaborate packet. Uh, so you can put this packet aside. Uh, this one will be for Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning. 
And the one we'll focus on this morning is the one entitled Preaching Christ. And I believe your listening guide is about three pages long. Um, and so we will uh, just kind of dive in together. But if you will allow me, uh, let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. And so we rejoice and we are glad in it. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for putting air in our lungs. Thank you for putting purpose in our step. Thank you for calling us here to think about, consider, learn, grow, be reminded, be challenged of what it is to preach Christ. What an amazing, audacious, daunting task. We can't do it without you. Holy Spirit, we need your help even as we think about preaching. We pray that you will help us as we speak and as we listen, as we interact. Lord Jesus, please take these um, broken consonants and vowels that are pushed over air that we call words and help those words that we put into sentences, that we form into paragraphs, that we communicate a thought, help it to make sense. Because a lot of times we push those words over air and they don't make sense. So help us today with clarity, with passion, with conviction, with purpose to think about this idea of preaching Christ. Lord, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Brothers, you and I know that we live in a communication-drenched society. We live in an age of instant messages and high-speed internet connection, late-breaking news that's found on the tip of your iPhone, your smartphone. We're bombarded daily with hundreds of messages spoken by well-polished men and women on the radio and television who simply desire to deliver a message from our sponsor. For many people, the preacher has become nothing more than another salesman who gives a weekly sales pitch to approximately the same group of individuals. Some people have said that our culture has outgrown the need for preaching. It's been suggested that preaching should be sidelined for more effective, efficient forms of ministry and communication. Yet it is my conviction, and I dare say our conviction, that preaching should never be sidelined, but rather it should be placed in the paramount position of prominence within the life of the church, highly regarded, highly valued in the hearts and minds of Christian believers, brothers and sisters in the Lord. So from right out the gate, I submit to you that the church needs biblical preaching. The church needs biblical preachers. We need preachers who preach Christ and him crucified. If there was ever a time when the people of God need the man of God to proclaim the word of God, it is now in these days. Throughout history, it's clear that the church seems to rise and fall on her commitment to preaching. So Christ-centered preaching is not a sermonic form. Christ-centered preaching is a principled conviction. I've long been told that conviction is not something you hold, but rather it's something that holds you. A conviction sets the guardrails. A conviction keeps you in bounds. So for us to say that we will preach Christ, that's not a form of a sermon. No, no, that's a principled conviction. It sets the guardrail for our preaching, and it also sets the guardrail for our living. We preach Christ. As preachers of the gospel, we are bound by the book. I will frequently quote Robert Smith Jr. I'll frequently quote Haddon Robinson. I will frequently quote John MacArthur. I'll frequently quote many of the people that you and I love and, and hold so dear. But I'll never forget that Dr. Smith, my father of the ministry, would oftentimes say the Bible is a hymn book because it's all about him. <laughs> it's all about Christ Christ. 
It was John MacArthur who said, Christianity provides only one thing. It's the one thing every person needs. Christianity provides Christ. You can't say the word Christianity without first saying the word Christ. I mean, it, it comes out your mouth. I mean, it, it's, it's fundamental to who we are. As Christians, we are Christ people. And so the goal of Christ-centered preaching is not necessarily to impart information, although we do need to impart information. The goal of Christ-centered preaching is not even to incite inspiration, although we need to inspire people to live for Christ. But the ultimate goal of our preaching is biblical transformation for the glory of God centered upon Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. So allow me just to give a few working definitions for preaching. You have them there listed on your sheet. I offer three. There are a host of great definitions, but let me give you these three. It was John R.W. Stott who said, Biblical preaching is opening up the inspired text with such faithfulness and sensitivity that God's voice is heard and his people obey him. John R.W. Stott first and foremost, says that biblical preaching is opening up the inspired text. So at some level, um, there's an aspect where it is closed. It needs to be opened. It needs to be exposed in expositional preaching. So it's the opening up of the inspired text. With such faithfulness to that text and sensitivity to the people who are listening, that God's voice is heard and his people obey him. When you get done preaching, don't, don't you desire, don't you want for somebody to tell you, I heard the voice of God today. Preacher, God, God spoke to me today. I mean, isn't that the goal? Isn't that what you want? You don't, you don't want people to come to hear your half-baked ideas because at best that's what they are, half-baked you don't want somebody to come and you just give them your opinion. You, you, you don't want to give them just your bias or, or, or your slant. I mean, you want people to hear the very word of God because that's what people need. When they come into these doors of God's house, they need to meet the God of the house. Maybe people aren't coming to church after COVID because churches have forgotten that we're just supposed to introduce people to Jesus. That when they come into the house of God, they need to meet Jesus. They need to hear from him. They need to hear his voice. They need to hear his word, his truth in the midst of chaos, in a world of, of confusion. They need to hear Christ. So John W. Stott says that this preaching is to open up, is to expose the inspired text. You're so faithful to the text because you can't say what the text doesn't say. You have to say only what the text says. And Robinson would oftentimes tell us that the text can never mean what it never was intended to mean. So you gotta open up the text, such faithfulness to the text and sensitivity to the people. Yeah, you gotta be sensitive to the folks. You gotta know who they are and kind of where they're coming from. So faithfulness to the text, sensitivity to the people, so that God's voice is heard and his people obey him. John R.W. Stott would say the sermon is not over at the final amen. The sermon is over when people begin to obey the word of God. That the sermon continues out the door. The sermon continues as the people leave the church, as they process what they've heard by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they apply it in their life, and you see fruit of that obedience in their behavior. So the preaching that we're called to do is something that we do behind the podium, uh, in front of the book, but it continues long after we say our final amen. So that's what John R. W. Stott said. It was Haddon Robinson in his book, Biblical, uh, The Big Idea of Preaching. Had Robinson defined preaching in this way. It is the communication of a biblical concept. It is derived from, transmitted through, a historical, grammatical, literary study of a passage in its context, which the Holy Spirit first applies to the personality and experience of the preacher, and then through the preacher applies to the hearers. Robinson said that preaching is communication. Communication of a biblical concept. Now, Robinson would always talk about the big idea. 
The big idea of preaching, the biblical concept is the big idea. And for him, the big idea was always made up of a subject and a compliment. The subject is, what is the author talking about? The compliment is, what is he saying about what he's talking about? So Robinson would always tell us that the subject cannot be one word. You can't say the subject is peace. No, you can say the subject of a particular passage is what is peace. Or you can't say, oh, it's Jesus. No, no, the biblical author is telling you who is Jesus. That's the subject. What's he saying about what he's talking about? Well, he's saying that Jesus is the Savior who always supplies. You know, whatever the compliment may be. And so Robinson would say, you put those two things together, the subject and the compliment, and you begin to form the big idea. That big idea has to be found, bound, and rooted right there in that biblical concept, in the biblical text. So it's communication of a big idea, biblical concept. It is derived from and transmitted through, and here this was big, historical, grammatical, literary study. We spend a lot of time doing this, don't we, preachers? We study, we do the historical background. What was happening uh, at the time of the writing? Who wrote it? Uh, what was going on in the Roman Empire, for example? The grammatical. What do these words mean? This is where we get elbow deep into a word study, right? We do the historical, the grammatical, the literary study. What, what literary genre is this passage? Because it does make a difference. You do not preach a proverb the same way you preach a narrative. So what literary genre is it? So you, you, you know that the, 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 the meaning is, is packed right there in the words. So what's the historical, grammatical, literary study of the passage? Which the Holy Spirit, don't ever forget the Holy Spirit, right? Which the Holy Spirit first has to apply to the preacher. And then through the preacher, applies it to the hearer. Because if we ever stand up to preach a message that has not first touched us, it will not touch the people. I mean, we, we come to the podium bloody, don't we? I mean, we come to the preaching moment and we've been cut and scraped and nicked and poked and prodded and the scripture has done all that to us first before we can ever attempt to proclaim thus saith the Lord to the congregation. So it's got to first be applied to us. If we peddle a gospel that we do not believe, if we peddle a gospel that we do not live, we need to stop peddling this gospel. Because it's got to be something that first has affected us as the preacher by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then through that preacher, it, it applies to the hearers. The third definition I'll give you is in the book entitled Power in the Pulpit, Jerry Vines, Jim Shaddix. They define preaching as the oral communication of a biblical truth. There's a lot of similarity here, right? Oral communication of a biblical truth, a big idea. Uh, Vines and Shaddix will call it the CIT central idea of the text. But it's the oral communication of a biblical truth by the Holy Spirit through a human personality to a given audience with the intent of enabling a positive response. We do want to tell the congregation what the text says. And then we want to tell them, so what? And then ultimately we got to tell them, now what? Now what are they supposed to do with it? And we're supposed to present it in clear ways to enable a positive response. Response. They further define expository preaching as a discourse that expounds a passage of Scripture, organizes it around a central theme and main divisions which issue forth from a given text and then decisively applies its message to the listeners. Now, regardless of whether it's Stott or Robinson or Vines, every good definition of preaching calls the preacher to begin with the Scripture passage. The church needs preaching that is rooted in the inspired text. Robinson would oftentimes tell us it's not true because it's in the Bible, but rather it's in the Bible because it's true. Fred Craddock said that getting into the text is a difficult task. Why? Because it's hard work. You're moving around in a strange world. It's not familiar to you. And it's really more about listening and learning than the mastery of particular material. So we go into the text and we listen to the conversation that began long before we got there. 
right? We're, we're going into the text and, and we're, we're eavesdropping on a conversation that started so many years ago. We don't need to bring our presuppositions, our understandings, our biases to the text before we listen to the text. So preaching that has any power at all is preaching that comes from the word of God. Paul reminds Timothy, all scriptures God breathed is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all forms of righteousness. There is no power in proclaiming personal opinion, advice, suggestions, or as I said earlier, half-baked ideas. Oh my goodness, the church needs preaching that is bound to the book. It may sound obvious, but a sermon must be tied to a text. It was Nelson Bell who said, the preacher without a scripture text is like a surgeon without a scalpel. Without the Bible, the preacher cannot perform his task because without God's word, we have nothing to say. Yet preaching does imply that we do have something to say, right? I mean, preaching is an oral communication. We have something to say. It's an oral communication of biblical truth by the Holy Spirit through the human personality to a given audience. So we stand in a long line of what I'll call sanctified spokesmen. I mean, we stand in a long line of those, right? The Old Testament prophet confidently spoke the words of the Lord. Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. Moses was the mediator between the word of God and the people of God. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, they all stood and said, thus saith the Lord. When the people heard the prophet of God, they knew they were listening to the very words of God. And as preachers, we, don't only, we not only speak about God, but we speak for God, don't we? I mean, we speak for the Lord. We, we are telling people what the Lord has to say about a host of issues, a host of topics within our culture, within our church, within our lives. So we have to be very careful that what we say comes from the Lord and not just from us. i got to confess to you that the task of preaching is audacious. It's, it's really uh, it's mind-boggling, isn't it, that God would call us to preach? It's, a, it's amazing to me why God would ask a sinner like me to be a spokesman. I mean, I look out and I see a lot of other candidates I mean, I think you're more qualified than me. In fact, you're more qualified than me to be right here right now. But why, why would God do this? It's audacious. It's mind-boggling. It's amazing that God would call a sinner like me to be a spokesman. I, I, I don't know your faults. For some of us, we haven't even met yet. Maybe we met each other last year. But I don't know your faults. But I do know mine. I'm well aware of my failures, my flaws, my hang-ups, and my hurts. It's always astounding that God uses a blemished preacher like me to speak on his behalf. Now, here in these days at First Baptist Pelham, we've been walking through judges. And it's been very profitable, I think. In Judges chapter 2, verse 10, this is what we read. Now, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. What a daunting, devastating statement of Scripture. A new generation came up behind us. A new generation was raised. And this is how they were known. They neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for his people. Israel. It's not that the new generation was completely ignorant or stupid. No, they had knowledge that there was a God. The problem was that they did not know God personally. They didn't know him passionately. They did not know the God who spoke the world into existence. They didn't know the God who 
made everything visible and invisible. They didn't know the God who protected Noah and his family from the worldwide flood. They didn't personally know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't know the God who had delivered their forefathers from Egyptian captivity. They did not know the God who parted the Red Sea so the Israelites could cross on dry ground, even though Pharaoh and his army were fast behind them. They did not know the God who handed his word to his people by inscribing his commandments with his very finger on tablets of stone. They did not know this God who gave them the promised land. They did not know the God who promised victory because of obedience. They did not know God. The greatest tragedy in life is to regard yourself as spiritual but not know the Savior or to think of yourself as religious but not know the Redeemer. God longs to be known And yet this generation did not know him. It was St. Augustine who said, God thirsts to be thirsted after. I mean, God wants to be known. He wants to be known by every generation. So as I read that text and as we walk through it at First Baptist Pelham, this was the question that came to my mind. Who was to blame? Who was to blame for that generation being raised, not knowing the Lord, And not knowing what he had done for his people. Who was to blame? Now certainly, I mean, people, individuals are responsible. I mean, you can be as close to God as you want to be, right? The person most responsible for your walk with the Lord is the person seated between the individual on your right and on your left. It's you, right? I mean, I get that. I understand that. But ultimately, as I thought about this, as I worked through that text, I said there there are two groups of people that really are to blame, parents and preachers. In that day, and probably in this day too, if there's a generation coming behind us and they do not know the Lord, who's to blame, parents and preachers? Just stop and think with me. Every Israelite knew the great Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus called it the greatest commandment. Immediately following those words in Deuteronomy 6, we read these words. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. That word impress is a strong word. It means to stamp, to mold. We could even use the idea of tattoo. We are to tattoo our, the commands of God upon our children. It's the responsibility, it's the privilege of godly parents to raise godly children through the teaching of godly instruction. And yes, I know we live in a day when you got to qualify every term. And what I mean by a parent is a biological man and a biological woman who comes together by God's design in marriage and they have Children and children who are only one of two genders, because they're only two genders, he made them male and female. So either you got sons or daughters, but whether they're sons or daughters, mom and dad come together to raise the children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I'm just clarifying terms. Because I'm living in a culture that cannot decide and cannot decipher what a gender is, when life begins. So I'm just I'm just clarifying terms. By God's design. I thought I'd be at home. Yeah. So, so here, uh, we as parents are to stamp and to mold, even tattoo, the commands of God upon our children. Parents must be the greatest theologian in the child's life. Here's a scary question. If you have sons or daughters, uh, to ask that son or daughter, who is the godliest guy you know? And dad, if it's not you, at some level you failed him. Asking my son, asking my daughter, who's the godliest guy you know? It's not because I'm on some ego trip. It's just I'm just checking myself. Have I, have I done what I'm supposed to do or have I gotten distracted? by all the other good things that I'm supposed to be about. But if I, if I miss as a godly dad and a godly husband, I've missed completely. 
So parents need to be the greatest theologians. The main link between what one generation knows about God, what the next generation will know about God, is the link of a parent and a child. It's not the only link, but it is one of the major ones. So we are to pass on the faith. Parents have a huge responsibility. Jesus knew this. That's why he scolds his disciples for telling parents not to bother Jesus with their children. He said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. By direct implication, he is teaching that a parent's primary task is to bring their children to Jesus. I've got to remind myself of this. I've got to remind the people that I preach to of this. Look, your primary responsibility as parent is not to teach your son or daughter how to shoot a three-pointer, throw a spiral, build a tree stand, or how to go shopping and get the best sales at the mall. Your primary task is to introduce them to Jesus. I mean, that, that, you're, you're the link between what what was given to you from a previous generation and you pass on and deposit to the next generation. So the parent's primary task is to bring that child to Christ. I met a few parents and probably you've met them too. They're in your congregation as well as mine. Parents who've said, you know what? I just don't want to coerce my children into Christianity. I just want them to figure it out on their own. I want them just to come to their own conclusions. And when I'm snarky enough, I'll look in the eyes of those parents and I'll ask them, do you have the same teaching strategy when it comes to the truth about electricity? I don't want to teach my child about the power of electricity. Let them figure it out on their own. No. I mean, you tell Johnny, don't you dare stick your finger in that socket. Because I know better. If you do that, that'll cause you a lot of pain. Just listen to my words, son and daughter. So to those parents who say, you know, it's, it's, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility. Yes, 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 it is. It's impossible not to teach your children. It's impossible not to teach them. In many ways, they are products of their environment, whether good or bad. To teach them nothing about Jesus is to teach them something detrimental about Jesus. But not only were the parents negligent. Now let's bring it even closer home. So were the preachers. In Deuteronomy, the priests were instructed to read and teach the Torah. Apparently their teaching was negligent, perverted. Maybe people were falling asleep. (laughs) Maybe they just weren't listening. Maybe they weren't really saying, thus saith the Lord. But regardless, the the preachers, the, the priests, they were not proclaiming, they were not teaching the Torah. And a major link between generations is found in the role of parents, but it's also found in the responsibility of the church. What this generation knows about God, what the next generation will know about God, is largely dependent upon how seriously the church takes her responsibility in general and how seriously the preacher takes his responsibility in particular. It is our task to know God and to make him known. And for some children, many children, who come through the doors of the congregations that we serve, the only link that child has to God is perhaps what comes from a home where parents live as if God doesn't exist. And certainly there are many in our culture who live live as if God doesn't exist. And as preachers, we've got to speak not only about God but for God. According to the New Testament, uh, preaching is, is God in action. It's the Apostle Peter reminding his listeners in the opening chapter of of his first letter, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living, enduring word of God. This is the word that was preached to you. So our responsibility as expositors is to open up the inspired text in such a way that it speaks the message clearly, plainly, accurately, relevantly, without addition, without subtraction, without falsification. It was Robinson who said that preaching is a living interaction involving God, the preacher, and the congregation. Preaching is not dead. Preaching is not lifeless. Preaching is not irrelevant, stagnant, or stale. It is not stuffy or boring. It is a living interaction. It was Philip Brooks who said, preaching is truth through your personality. 
So God deposited his truth into his word through the sacred writings of the Holy Spirit-inspired biblical authors. And the truth is then mined by the preacher, applied first to the life of the proclaimer, and then through his personality, spoken and applied to the lives of the listeners. There is nothing else on the planet that captures this dynamic like preaching. We have the awesome task to hear God's word and to proclaim it. There's nothing else like preaching. There's no, there, there's, there's no other mechanism. There's no other model. There's no other task that captures this capacity to hear and mind the truth, put it into words that are understandable for various generations, and proclaim it to people who desperately need to hear it so that they hear the very voice of God and they know how to respond. Once again, Robinson would oftentimes tell us, God is not speaking to men today about the Bible, but God speaks to men and women today about themselves from the Bible. You don't have to make the Bible relevant. It already is. You just have to reveal it. People come into the congregation, the youngest of children, the oldest of adults, and whether they know it or not, what they need to hear is a word from God. They need to hear his truth, what he says about this topic, this subject, this passage. And we speak to them from the pages of the Bible. It's at this moment that Brian Chappell is extremely helpful in his book, Christ-Centered Preaching. He writes concerning the FCF, the Fallen Condition Focus. He says the Fallen Condition Focus is a mutual human condition that contemporary believers share with those to whom and for whom the text was written. And it requires the grace of the passage so that people see themselves in the text. That, that's really the sweet spot, isn't it? When people begin to see themselves in the text, in the passage. It was James Sanders who famously said, biblical characters are not given to us as models for morality, but rather as mirrors for identity. When we peek and peer into the pages of Scripture, we see ourselves. We see examples of not how we ought to live, but examples of how we actually live. And so we, we preach the Bible as a mirror, and people see themselves, and they hear what God has to say to them. The world's greatest need still lostness the world's greatest need and the only solution is the gospel and we've got it and we know it so we proclaim it Christians and non-Christians differ not in their needs but in the way their needs are met Christians have the same needs as non-Christians non-Christians have the same needs as Christians the difference is, how are those needs met? And for Christians, all of our needs are met in Christ. So Ray Stedman said, the New Testament is not 20 centuries old. It's one century repeated 20 times. It's not so antiquated and out of date. No, it's as contemporary as the stories that you read on your iPhone this morning from the Chattanooga Tribune or whatever it is that you get, right? I mean, it's, it's not 20 centuries old. The Bible is one century repeated 20 times. Our task is to reveal the re uh, relevance of the Scripture. People need to know what God has to say to them from the sacred text. So we can't be silent and we can't misquote the Lord. We dare not minimize we dare not discard what God says. So preaching is the oral communication of a biblical truth by the Holy Spirit through a human personality given to an audience. And it's given with the intent of enabling a positive response so they may hear God's voice and obey him. Stott echoes this in his definition. For, God, for preaching is not over until obedience is derived. For the aim of preaching is to impart transformation. Tony Evans, it's the transformed mind, he said, producing transformed feet that we're after. If all we get are biblically literate people, then we've missed it. 
transformed mind producing transformed feet. That's what we desire to do in preaching. Look, most people don't care when the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. I mean, we care, right? Because we've done the historical, grammatical, literary study. We, we care that 722, those barbaric uh, Assyrians came in in the northern kingdom. I and mean, we care about that. But listen, e- even if they learn those facts, the task of preaching is not complete until the people learn that following the Lord makes a real difference. If you don't follow the Lord, there are always consequences. So biblical preaching is opening up the inspired text with such faithfulness to the text, sensitivity to the needs of the people, that God's voice is heard and his people obey him. Now all of that, you say, uh, Davin, where, I'm not I'm the listening guy, where am I? We just finished section one, all right? That's just the definition of preaching. So we just kind of work through that, all right? Now, let's, let's also tackle this idea of, of the call of God and the word of God. God is much more interested in developing messengers than messages. Jeremiah uh, said, it's fire, shut up in my bones. Spurgeon said, was asked one day, why do people come here you preach? And you know the answer. He said, the Lord sets me on fire all week long and people come just to watch me burn. (laughs) Woe to us if we don't preach, right? It's um, like Peter and John who stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4 and they had a bad case that can't help us. We just can't help but speak about what we've seen, about what we've heard. But tragically, uh, Steve Brown is exactly right. This is what he says. The church has become a place where a nice, pleasant, bland person stands in front of other nice, pleasant, bland people, urging them to be nicer, more pleasant, and more bland. The problem is that Jesus did not come and die on the cross to create nice, pleasant, bland people. He came and died on the cross so that sinners could find forgiveness, and in the joy and exuberance of that discovery, they'd find impossible to keep quiet about him. If all we're doing are creating nice, pleasant, bland people, That may be our problem. We have the gospel that when proclaimed by the power of the Holy Spirit, dead people come to life. Dead people come to life. I mean, that's exciting, right? Dead people come to life. I I, I know that people walk in and they're still breathing, but sometimes people walk in and they're dead as a doornail. They're dead spiritually. Yet the gospel is proclaimed, and and what a beautiful sight when you're able to see the transformation that goes on in the hearts and the mind. The eyes light up, and the heart explodes, and tears of love stream down their cheeks. And what you're seeing is a dead person come to life again. And in the joy and exuberance of that discovery, we cannot keep quiet about it. We can't be silent. I, I remember feeling called of God to preach at the age of 17. I actually felt called at the age of 16, but like Jonah, I tried to run in the opposite direction. Do you know you cannot outrun the righteous one? You cannot outmaneuver the Messiah. I tried for months, and he is the hound from heaven. He pursues us. He captures us. When I was 17, I surrendered to a call to preach. I told my family. I told my pastor at that time. I told the local congregation Uh, The very next week, he put me up in the pulpit. Guys, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what to say. I think the sermon was probably seven minutes long. May have been the best sermon I've ever preached, right? I can't remember what even what it was about. But I know this. In that moment, something sparked inside of me. And I remember walking away from that Sunday night experience thinking, I was made for this. This is why I was created. It began the love affair between uh, the pulpit and the pew to be able to to, to preach the word of God. So in the process, I, I, I proceeded to try to talk to every pastor I knew in the area in an effort to discern more clearly what God was doing and what this call of God meant upon my life. Most of the conversations were uplifting and encouraging. But then I remember that one lunch at Wendy's restaurant. I'll never forget it. 
I was seated across the table from a younger preacher, uh, middle aged probably. Um, he had been preaching for several years, and he began the lunch by saying this If you can see yourself doing anything else with your life other than preaching, do it. If you can do anything else, do it. And I got to confess, that's not what I expected to hear. I mean, I was expecting a word of encouragement, and that was the most discouraging word of encouragement I'd ever heard. I can't tell you anything else about the conversation. I walked away. I got in my car. I drove away more than slightly depressed. Now, in hindsight, I understand what the preacher was talking about. He was not trying to be hurtful. He was actually trying to be helpful. He knew that if God had truly called me to preach, then there would be nothing else in the world that I could do except preach. I worked through the conversation. I came to the conclusion I was put on this planet to proclaim God's word to God's people in God's world. I can't see myself doing anything else. To borrow the words of Jerry Vines in his book, he writes, We live in a day when men are leaving the ministry in droves. The statistics are staggering. Tired of frustration, emotional strain, controversy both inside and outside the church, long hours. Can I get an amen? They're turning their backs on God's call, pursuing other things. If a man goes into ministry for any other reason than the inward prompting of the Holy Spirit, then he is doing it for the wrong reason. Chances are that he will not last. The longer I go in ministry, the more frequent I ask the question, why would anyone volunteer for this? I know that might sound pessimistic. I don't mean it that way. I mean, but really, why would anybody volunteer to go into ministry where there's so many heartaches, so much sickness, so much suffering, so much brokenness, so many failed marriages, so much addiction, so much perversion, uh, so much sexual perversion, so much disappointment, so much agony, to the point I remember one time my father looked at me, my, my biological dad looked at me and said, do you actually think you're doing any good? Why would anybody volunteer for this? And then it dawned on me. We didn't. We didn't volunteer for this. We got divinely drafted, sovereignly selected, Christologically chosen by God for this task. If it weren't for the inward prompting of the Holy Spirit, the firm foundation of God's call upon our lives, we would have gotten off the exit ramp many miles ago. But because of our sufficient Savior, because of our sovereign Lord, who has loved us and saved us and redeemed us and called us, woe to us if we ever attempt to try to do anything other than preach. Woe to us if we try to attempt to take the exit ramp. It was Clovis Chapel who wrote, if God has called us to preach, he has done so because he knows that we can do something for him that no one else can do. God chose you on purpose, brother. God selected you on purpose. He plopped you and planted you in the congregation you're in on purpose. I know there are some days you say, God, do you know what you were doing? Did you know Bob was in this congregation before I came? And God says, yeah, I know exactly what I'm doing. And you know what? You're the perfect person for the job. You're the perfect person to deal with him or her, that, into, that scenario, that person. You're, you're the one. So if God has called you, brother, he did it on purpose. He didn't make a mistake. Wherever he's plopped you and planted you, he put you there on purpose. My friends, this is not a job. It's a calling of God. So we are equipped with the call of God, but we're also equipped with the word of God, right? We preach the scripture because we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. The doctrine of plenary inspiration, which I have written there in your listening God, simply says that the original documents of the Bible were written by men who, though permitted to exercise the exercise of their own personalities and literary talents, yet wrote under the control and guidance of the Spirit of God, the result being in every word of the original documents a perfect and errorless recording of the exact message which God desired to give to man. In his book entitled The Modern Preacher in the Ancient Text, it's Sidney Gradanus, 
who said the Bible is authored 100% by God and 100% by man. That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? How can the scripture be written by God and written by man? Well, we affirm an other paradox when it comes to the identity of Jesus, for example. Uh, we affirm that Jesus is very God and very man, 100% divine, 100% human. I heard HB say this. I think he was the first one that I heard say this, that Jesus is not a man who became God of which there have been none. He is not a godly man of which there have been many. He was and is the God man, fully God and fully human. He's not a 50-50 split. Jesus is not an 80-20 split. He's a 100-100% split. It's impossible. Well, except for God. Our salvation. Our salvation has this idea. It's initiated. It's accomplished. It's sustained. It's completed by God and God alone. Salvation belongs to our Lord. And yet, there's a human responsibility we have been chosen before the very foundation of the world. And at the same time, whoever, whosoever will, may come. It's not a contradiction. That's two sides of the salvific coin, beautifully and perfectly working together. Listen, friends, only a high view of Scripture will demand the necessity for expository preaching. But it's only through biblical preaching that we hear what God has to say. So expository preaching expounds the scripture to derive the big idea, subsequent subpoints from the text, and the sermon discloses the thought of the author, covers the scope of the passage, it's applied to the lives of the listener. The authority of the Bible comes from the Bible. Truth is not imposed in the text, it's exposed from the text. So as a reader, uh, we don't just bring new meaning into the text, Based upon our human experiences, no, the authority of the Scripture comes from the Scripture. That's why in Robinson's earlier definition, he emphasized historical, grammatical, literary study of the passage. The truth is in the text. It's not what you bring to the text. It's not even what the original audience understood it to be. It's found in the words. So I came across this statement. The wow comes from the word. The wow of the passage comes from the words of the passage. It's only from that vantage point that we're able to discern the very word of God. So we have a call of God that is unshakable. We have a word of God that is inerrant. Who can stop us? I mean, stop and think about it. I don't care how bad the day is. I've got a call of God that's unshakable. I've got the word of God that is perfect in every sense. We got the world by the tail, right? I mean, we've got the capacity to stand up with confidence to say, thus saith the Lord. Yes. Now, the one who called us and the one to whom the Bible speaks is none other than Jesus, right? Amen. And Jesus, he's in a class all by himself. Once again, Dr. Smith said, the Bible does not reveal the plan of salvation. It reveals the man of salvation, Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. We see this displayed perfectly on the mountain of transfiguration. If you give me just a few minutes, let me just talk and have some fun with Jesus. As Jesus was praying on the mountain of transfiguration, the, his, his appearance of his face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. The transfiguration took place from the inside out. I like what William Lane said. He said that in a brief moment, the veil of the humanity of Jesus was lifted and the disciples saw sheer divinity. Just for a moment, the veil was lifted and what shone through was the sheer divinity and the glory of Christ. For this brief moment, the Lord gave his disciples a sneak peek of his splendor. And they beheld a glimpse of his glory. Peter, James, and John were there. And it's Luke who tells us they were asleep. What? You gotta be kidding. Jesus is being transfigured, right? His humanity is the divinity shining through. And you're sawing logs? Peter, James, John, wake up. What's going on? They were briefly asleep. For a brief moment, the Lord gave a, a sneak peek. Heaven confirmed what Peter had earlier confessed, that Jesus is the Christ. 
Two men appeared, Moses and Elijah. They came from heaven. Luke said they appeared in glorious splendor. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And they speak about his departure, his exodon. His liberation, how he's came to liberate us, not from the slavery in Egypt, but to liberate us from a far worse taskmaster, the slavery of our own sin. And Moses and Elijah came to talk about that great deliverance. If you ever wondered, uh, what is heaven preoccupied about? It's about Jesus. They're preoccupied about Jesus. They came, Moses and Elijah came, not to give halftime adjustments or instruct Jesus on a new deal or to give some late-breaking news from the throne room of God. No, they came to talk about what they'd always been talking about, which was the Lord Jesus. I mean, even as early as Genesis 3.15, we find the necessity for Christ on the cross. I'll put enmity between your offspring and hers. In Revelation 13, 8, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus is described as the lamb who was slain before the very creation of the world. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. In God's mind, in God's mind, Jesus was crucified before Genesis 1, 1 ever came into being. Stop and think about that. In God's mind, Jesus was crucified before, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. He was crucified before Genesis 1-1, and God's plan of salvation has never, ever changed. Moses and Elijah came from heaven, and uh, they were in heaven not because they'd earned salvation, but because of obedience to the law, or or, uh, wait a minute, They, they, they were in heaven not because they had earned salvation through obedience to the law, but because they believed in Jesus. Let me be very clear on that. They, they're in heaven because they believed in Jesus. They had forward looking faith to Christ. And we have a faith that looks back to Calvary. But anyone who's in heaven is there because they've been looking to Jesus. Now, this great conversation did cause Peter, James, and John to kind of drift off into sleep. And finally, they were jolted from their slumber. And it's Peter who said, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's prolong this mountaintop moment. Let's build three shelters, three altars, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Sounds like a great idea, right? I mean, what's the problem? He wants to keep the moment, memorialize the moment. What's the problem? Well, for the second time in Luke's gospel, the voice of God speaks. First time was at the baptism. This time God says, this is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. When the cloud vanished, Peter, James, and John found that Jesus was alone. That's significant, right? I mean, he's in a class all by himself. It's Jesus, not Moses, who is Christ. It's Jesus, not Elijah, who is Christ. Jesus, not anyone else, but Jesus is Christ. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. You know this well. It's not like he was born to Mr. and Mrs. Christ. You don't find his phone number by looking it up under the C's in the directory. No, Christ is his title. That's who he is. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. The greatest theological statement you can make is Jesus Christ. It's the greatest theological statement that can be made. It's to declare Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus is Christ. You say Jesus Christ is the greatest theological statement that could come from your lips. Jesus is Lord. He's in a class all by himself. Nobody can rival his supremacy. No one can surpass his sovereignty. Jesus is Christ. So if you'll allow me, i got to confess that uh, Jesus is more faithful than Abraham. He's greater deliverer than Moses. He's more priestly than Aaron. He's more prophetic than Isaiah. He's purer than King David. He's wiser than King Solomon. He's stronger than Samson. He's more patient than Job. He's more obedient than Jonah. He's more devoted than Hosea. He's more consistent than John the Baptist. He's more even-tempered than Simon Peter. He's more beloved than the disciple named John. He's more committed than the apostle named Peter. He's the only savior of the universe. He's our only hope for mankind. 
He is irreplaceable and he is irresistible. He is unstoppable. He's graciously approachable. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily of the valley. He is the righteous judge. He is the merciful redeemer. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He can heal the sick. He can help the sinner. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got his eye on the sparrow. He can mend the brokenhearted. He can break the hard hearted. He's the maker of heaven, of earth. He's the savior of my life and yours. Jesus Judas could not distract him. Pilate could not destroy him. Satan could not dethrone him. In him, we have all that we need. In him, our dreams find fulfillment. In him, our hope finds a resting place. In him, our past is wiped away. In him, our present life has joy and abundance. In him, we have eternity for all of uh, uh, security. In him, in the words of S.M. Lockridge, that's my king, right? I mean, that's Jesus. That's what we have. We have the call of God that's unshakable. We have the word of God that is irrefutable. It is without error. And the one who called us and the one who authored the word is the Lord Jesus. And he's like no other. When people come into the churches that we pastor, Let them see Jesus. Let them smell Jesus. Let them look upon Jesus. Let them gaze upon Jesus. Let us lift him high so that he might be glorified. I was told we need to take a break about now. So let's do that. It's a good time to take a break. All right. So we'll take about a five minute break and then we'll come back together. Uh, and, uh, This is taking longer than what I thought, so we're just going to keep on going, all right? All right? All right? So we'll take about a five-minute break, and then we'll get back together. Thanks, guys.